uh, Duncan Bannatyne uh, in the den, ripped us to shreds, told us that his seven-year-old daughter could make better products. Uh, we met him off camera outside and uh, I thought he was going to come up and say, hello, congratulations. No, none of that. He stalked over, said, if that investment goes through, I'm a Dutchman, and then stalked off. No way. <laughs> yeah, I've arranged to send him some Dutchy damn cheese. Rachel Watkin is the founder and now is the CEO of the Tiny Box Company, a company that actually isn't so tiny. So we're going to do a deep dive into her entrepreneurship journey, but I think the best place to start is growing up. So did you always want to be an entrepreneur growing up or did you have other aspirations? I clearly did always want to be an entrepreneur. When I was about five, I got given a chess set and I used to move all the pieces around like they were my employees. By seven or eight, I was working the strawberry fields in the summer, picking for money. Um, I had very small hands, so I had a really good system. Pick one, eat one, pick one, eat one. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I did that for every summer, you know, as long as the strawberry, um, strawberry picking time was. And the farmers used to come and collect me in a minibus. I mean, highly illegal now. Um, but it worked and then by 12 i was dabbling in bric-a-brac where i'd go and collect neighbors junks uh whatever junk and then sell it on my on my junk stool no way was was that like uh just outside on on the lawn or um, or car so where in? we live they when we where we lived they used to have like open days so i'd do it on the open days and some days i got like 75 pounds which when i was 12 it was a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> so how did that kind of transpire as you as you grew up? And, you know, um, yeah, did you, uh, you know, when you were going into education, did you go into university? Um, was that kind of the path that you wanted to go down? Um, yeah. I don't believe that there is a single entrepreneur who's who every business has been successful. Um, I went to uni, um, did business studies, um, majoring in finance. Um, then got a placement with John Lewis doing um, financial accounting and stock accounting on the management training scheme and set up a business in my spare time with my best friend. We worked out that you could buy clothes at jumble sale for like 10p and we figured that we could sell them at car boot sales for like a huge markup. So that was the plan and it stacked up on paper brilliantly. The only problem was you had to be at the jumble sales and the car boot sales at like seven o'clock in the morning on Saturdays and Sundays. And being 22 and heavily into partying and alcohol, it it never happened. So we'd roll up late, we'd miss all the best stuff. We'd then have nothing to sell. And um, it was a disaster. And I remember my best friend writing a poster one day saying, buy any two items and get the blonde girl free, i.e. me. <laughs> <laughs> and we still didn't sell anything oh, no. <laughs> and that was the end of my first business <laughs> oh gosh so after that did you go into a mainstream like I guess becoming an employee for a business yeah so as I say I did the management training scheme with John Lewis and then I went into treasury because uh, that was far more interesting and then ended up selling software solutions and um, and I loved that because it was it was pretty entrepreneurial. You know, I wasn't in the office nine to five. I was traveling all around the world. Never knew where I was going to be. Loved it. Um, yeah, couldn't have asked for a better training background in some ways. And where did that lead you? Did you? Yeah, what kind of skills did you get out of that? Um, I learned to present, which helps. <laughs> um, but one of the key things was just being thrown into any environment and being able to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So I could go into the office and be told that I was in Malta on a Monday, Canada on the Wednesday. Um, yeah, never knew where I was going to be. And you learn really strong resilience and independence skills. Um, Travelled to Africa one day, left my suitcase with a porter, and my suitcase was clearly used for a drug run. You know, won't make that mistake again. Um, <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> so yeah, you learn a lot. No kidding. <laughs> so how did that, um, yeah, how did you go from 
working in sales to to get to tiny box companies you, you ended up um yeah where did the, the idea come from in one of my postings um i was sitting in the office it was around christmas it was really quiet typical sales team you know all gone home for christmas and the phone goes and i was responsible for the uk technical sales team um, but the phone goes and it was the accountant general of sierra leone saying do you think you guys could help us build a system way out of my remit you know not my territory but i went to the sales director and said can i run with it anyway because they want a quick deal they want it done over christmas i live locally no brainer so he said go sure so i was thinking cocktails sombreros you know safaris lovely hot climate on the beach um <laughs> the reality could not have been more different there was a queue going on that um there were roadblocks every hundred yards uh, a curfew in actual fact a lot of what we're seeing in ukraine now um and I was in the middle of it. Um, you could hear the gunfire around the city. The rebels were moving in and in on the city all the time. Um, and the Ecomog soldiers were trying to keep them back. Um, so the point of this was that it changed my life. It changed my, out, uh, my outlook totally, where I suddenly realized that pure capitalism doesn't work. You know, we need a better solution. Um, so I set up an early fair trade company and it was my sister that then said, uh, what are you going to put the jewellery in? Because you can't put it in uh, unethical packaging that's not sustainable. You know, you need to have a consistent message. I was like, oh, yeah, fair point. Um, and I couldn't find any. Could not find any. I went into all of the UK manufacturers, asked them for small quantities that didn't require a thousand units with a 10 to 12 week lead time for each size of box. I was like, this is crazy. You know, this is the 20, 21st century. Um, but they were just laughing at me and they were like, well, it'd never be mainstream. Nobody wants sustainability. So I said, fine, I'll do it myself. And that was the start. And, and so did you run the two companies in parallel? So you did jewelry and the boxes or just you went, you thought the boxes are going to, you know, be revolutionary and that's the way you're going to go. So initially we ran the two side by side. Mm -hmm. The boxes then just gained massive momentum um, and then I signed a deal with the Dragons on Dragon's Den and they said that for now I needed to park the jewellery and focus on the boxes so we can get that up and running and then later on go back to the jewellery. So that's still my plan. My plan was to sort of gain credibility, learn to run a business because mm -hmm. the clothing was so bad <laughs> and, 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 and go back to it later on. Amazing. So you touched on Dragon's Den, which I think is absolutely the coolest thing ever. Um, so uh, yeah, I kind of want to hear more about and I want you to share more about your experience on D Dragon's Den. So first of all, how did you get signed up to it? And yeah, how did you get even on onto the show? I am a great believer in fate. Lots of people out there will say oh, it's nonsense or whatever. But I bumped into a guy called Robin Banks, who was a very well known DJ at the time on Kiss 100 and Virgin. Um, I bumped into him while he was out shopping for a box in, in the local town. And we got chatting, as you do, and um, he'd had a small accident where he'd hijacked a radio station in the middle of the night and broadcast lots of stuff that he shouldn't. Um, and he'd been sent off to rehab. And he said, Rach, I just want a normal job now. I don't want to be in the public eye anymore. I just want a normal job. Can, what you're doing is great. Can I come and work with you? Interestingly, I said yes. Um, in hindsight, if somebody comes up to you trying to find a box, just don't don't go there. Um, because he realised very quickly on that he missed the broadcasting, he missed being in the public eye, uh, but he felt he'd committed himself and he didn't want to let me down. Uh, so he applied to Dragon's Den and didn't tell me, thinking that he could kickstart his career and find replacements to help the business for him. Um, and a couple of months later, the BBC called. He was actually in the office at the time and they said, uh, you know, what, what's your intention with the funds? What would you do with the money? And he just sat there just going, black it, black it, make it up. Um, so I did. 
um, and just talked, I just waffled, talked about stock and all sorts. Yes, you <laughs> um, do. <laughs> and the next thing I know, we are invited up to Pinewood Studios, which was filmed at the time. Um, five o'clock in the morning, I get up, bundle of nerves, um, drive up to Pinewood, go into hair and makeup, and then you get put in the green room because they don't want you bumping into the dragons off camera and sort of trying to twist their arm or whatever. So we spent the day in the green room, all day, drinking more and more coffee, getting more and more hyper. Um, and then about six o'clock, they sent us home. <laughs> they'd, <laughs> they'd overrun. So um, the next week we had to go back again, really hot day. It was so hot, it went into hair and makeup. And again, we didn't get into the, the den until late afternoon. Um, and by the time we did, all my makeup had run down my face all my hair had just frizzed into a massive frizz ball. So I actually didn't care about the pitch. I, <laughs> I was mortified that I was going out on national TV with this frizz ball of hair and makeup just slid down my face. Um, so yeah, the, the, when two of the dragons said yes, I remember thinking, well, I don't know how that happened because we've got nothing patentable, no trading history. We don't know what we're doing. I've never worked in packaging before. I mean, we weren't the outsider horse. We were the donkey with a missing leg. Um, it's um, quite inspiring though, that you guys actually <laughs> got the investments. You must have had a really solid pitch going going into it. Um, do you know, I spoke to Theo about this last week because he still remembers my pitch. And, and he said that what he remembered was that he said, I, you know, his normal line of, well, if I give you my children's inheritance, what are you going to give me? And he was expecting me to sort of baffle him with market share numbers and, um, and how many times I'm going to increase his revenue and all of that kind of thing. And I, well, I missed all that. I just said, well, I'm just going to work really hard <laughs> and, and I won't leave the office until the job's done. And, um, and I'm a workaholic. <laughs> that was it. So. You've managed to crack the code of the end. I, I think, to be honest, they just felt really sorry for me. Oh, no. and, and then Robin left the day of the filming to go back into broadcasting. Um, and amicably, you know, there was no fallout or anything. And um, yeah, and Peter Jones and Theo Pafitas came on board. Wow, it, it, it sounds absolutely amazing. Like you are one of the few people that do get investment on the show. You know, there's a lot of people that probably get cut off the show that don't even make it onto the show. And then to walk away with investment from two, you know, of the dragons is very impressive. So how did it help your business and what did you use the money for in terms of specifically the investment side? And then we'll go on to, I guess, the show itself, but specifically the investment from the Dragons. Um, we asked for 53,000 for, I think we originally said 25% of the company and we ended up doing 60,000 for 40% of the company. Um, now at the time we didn't really need the money because we were growing anyway. Um, the website launched November 2007 and in the first month we did about four and a half grand turnover which for a startup in the first month you know um, considering we'd never worked in the industry and had no connections um, we were doing okay but the money meant that we could move premises we could increase the range of stock um, and get my first member of staff <laughs> that must have been a nice feeling <laughs> it's scary it's scary I bet. Um, so in terms of the show itself, how did that help your business um, after it aired? And, you know, what was, you know, the impact on your business? It was aired in September 2008. And you're not allowed to tell anybody beforehand. You have to sign an NDA. Um, so you're not allowed to tell anybody the outcome. So I've got all my family and friends watching it with me. They have uh, no idea. No, they had no idea. Oh, my goodness. Um, and um, and then they obviously see that we get the money and I'm watching my website, which we'd done everything we could make sure that it would hold up. And I watched it crash within seconds <laughs> of Dragon's Den being aired because at the time there was about 4 million viewers. Um, and all I can say, I don't even remember the next few weeks other than it being utter chaos with the phones just nonstop um, anything from big 
chains to to nutters. Um, some bloke turned up at my dad's house with jewellery made out of dead people's hair for me. You know, they they all came out, um, and it was really really hard to just focus on running the business because you were sifting out all of the all of the calls that were just. I don't want to say time wasters because that's harsh, but you know, what was going to generate more business and, and what wasn't. Mm. Um, and of course, at the time, there's only me and one other member of staff. So I had to get a couple of temps in really quickly. They didn't know what they were doing. Um, yeah. And in hindsight, we could have handled it a lot better had we known what to prepare ourselves for. Mm. I guess, yeah, I guess it's difficult to, to say what the, the impact is going to be, but you know, at the same time, going out to 4 million people, um, you're you're bound to get some sort of traction aren't you well the problem is that you, when you film it i mean we were in there for over two hours mm -hmm. and it's condensed down to 10 minutes so you don't know how the bbc are going to edit it so they could either paint you really well or they could paint you really badly depending uh, on on how that edit occurs um i mean in the actual pitch i mean peter jones said something like i feel really sorry for you <laughs> <laughs> but they cut that out, you know, because he's supposed to be a hard dragon. <laughs> wow, so you're seeing all different sides of these dragons. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, we just didn't know. It was naivety. So then you kind of, you know, you get the investment. Now you're getting traction in the business. Um, and obviously you're starting to scale. So what were some of the growing pains that you experienced as a founder and as a business when you were scaling your business? Oh my God, where do I start? Um, the problem with business school, you know, I spent four years at business school and I learned about international accounting developments and fiscal policy and, you know, all of that kind of thing. Global macroeconomics versus microeconomics. No one showed me about how to fill in a VAT return, when I need to get VAT registered, how I get an employee contract together, you know, all of that real business stuff. Um, and I genuinely believe that we need to rethink our, our entrepreneurial and business studies courses to, to the reality of it. Mm. Um, because yes, I'd never run a business. As I said, I didn't know what I was doing and the dragons both said to me, which shocked me a bit, but they both said to me very early on, do you know what, you, you know what you're doing. So we're going to forward you the money and leave you to run the business and be silent partners. Um, and, and I didn't see that one coming because I was, you know, all your life you are, in, you know, when you're in the classroom, you're told what to do. When you're a toddler, you're told by your parents what to do. You go to college, you're told what to do. You go to work, you're told what to do. And, and I think in hindsight, I was looking for them to tell me what to do. And, and they weren't prepared to do that. They were like, no, that's not the deal. You need to go and run it and shout if you need help in a specific area. Um, so I literally felt like I was floundering and making it up as I went along. Um, it didn't help that very early on our warehouse caught fire. Um, one of the lights dropped out of the ceiling on a really hot day. There's a theme there somewhere. Um, and we lost a lot of stock. And then literally within about four months, uh, the most ridiculous flood I've ever seen. And I walked into the office and everything, the chairs were floating, you know. <laughs> Did you break a mirror seven years ago or something? Because <laughs> that just sounds like the worst luck that you could possibly get. I mean, I mean there's, a, there's a difference between having a little bit of wet on the floor and everything floating, you know. Uh, everything that was in there was completely destroyed. Um, so it was just like, okay, start again. Um, and then I didn't even know it was a thing. At the time, we were heavily e-commerce based, uh, like 95% of our revenue was on the website. Um, and suddenly our website disappeared from the Google rankings completely. Um, and it turned out we'd been blacklisted by Google. Didn't even know you could be. Um, but apparently we had indecent content. Google don't tell you. You have to work this out for yourself. We had indecent content. So they'd taken our site down from their search engines. Um, and it took us three weeks to work out what had happened. And somebody had hacked into our website and written white code over the top, which obviously we couldn't see, but the Google bots could. Oh gosh. Uh, 
And, and that in itself for an e-commerce business is enough to kill most businesses. If you've got no trade for three months, you know, you're dead in the water. Um, but yeah, we brushed ourselves off, picked up and started again. Um, so there's been a lot of hiccups. Um, but I guess from my traveling and I had a very unusual childhood. <laughs> Um, the, the parents were sort of absent for a lot of it. Um, so I guess you just get really resilient and you're like, okay, well, that's happened. How do we get around it? Mm. You know, we've, we've now got another great big wall in front of us. What's the easiest way to, to get from A to B round the wall? Um, and I think that that's what I've learned more than anything. It sounds like it sounds like you've been faced with a lot, a lot of things, and you've managed to keep going. So that's that's really impressive. Um, so going into kind of how your strategy um, changed from when you started up your business, because you were on Dragon's Den quite early on in the business. So how has the strategy changed as you kind of moved away from starting up the business into scaling it and um, moving it forward, essentially into present day? I'd love to say to you, do you know what? I had fantastic strategy plans and five-year business plans. Um, I learned on the job and whatever the customers wanted, I listened to the customers and then tried to fix what they wanted. For example, um, when we first set up the company, uh, it was agreed that we had one manufacturer that was working for us that could do printing for us. Anyway, it turned out very early on that that manufacturer hadn't been as transparent as they should have been on the green credentials so i no hesitation i had to can them um but we promised cut printing to our customers and i'd never printed a thing in my life so the first christmas i bought a machine off ebay there was no instruction manuals online or anything i had no idea how to work it it cost me 150 quid and it took me three weeks of learning how to print um and I can't tell you the amount of times that printer nearly went out the window. <laughs> and and it, it's now it's a lot more formalized, if you like. We, you know, we sort of plan ahead. Okay, well, we're still not offering what our customers want in this area. So how can we pivot the business to do that? So for example, at the moment, we do a lot of um, mailing boxes, thin mailing boxes. <clears throat> But customers, small customers may only have like 50 products, but they'll have it in four flavors mm. and they can't afford the printing of 50 times four when, the, when you've got setup costs. So now we're developing belly bands, you know, simple slips that go over the top where you can have small runs and just change the color or, or the name of, of the flavors. Um, so I think that, we're, you know, in businessy terms we have remained an incredibly organic flat structure rather than a bureaucracy and it's meant that we've been able to pivot and relax and react with agility as the market's changed mm. and has that led to then various innovation well it sounds like you are innovating your products quite a lot yeah. um so yeah, in terms of it, like, I guess, uh, innovations, does that come from you? Does that come from the customer? Where, yeah, where do you um, get your ideas from? I believe, rightly or wrongly, I believe that a lot of the times the answers are in the business. Whether the answers have come from the customers or wherever, we've got the answers. You just need to give the people that work in the company a voice to say what they think is, um, is, is a good way forward or what our customers want. Um, and, and that's really hard to sort of try and keep an open door policy as you get bigger and bigger and bigger. So, you know, now we're just shy of a hundred staff and it's like, how do you maintain that flat structure and the ideas flowing through? So what we do now is once a fortnight, I have lunch with staff at every level where they just come and have lunch with me, on me, and they can just come and chat to me about whatever they want, whether it's a moan, whether it's an idea. Um, and, and we have groups of six or eight people, so no one feels intimidated, and they just talk about whatever they want. Um, 
and that works really well. You know, there's nothing worse for me when I go into other companies and I see the CEO wandering around, doesn't even know the names of the people that work for them. How can they expect to keep their fingers on the pulse? So, you know, maybe I'm too hands on, but it's working so <laughs> um so i know that you've evolved as a, an entrepreneur and as a business so can you tell us about how tiny box the tiny box company has evolved um and what it's a, it, it has evolved into especially over covid um times what you guys have done to adapt and grow we have been really lucky despite all the hiccups and you know there's been loads more hiccups that i haven't talked about like cancer twice that was a yeah, that was a bit of a hiccup each time. Um, but we've been really lucky in really steady growth. Um, and we've got a really solid customer base. So we've got about 120,000 customers uh, from all sorts of sizes of business. Um, and it's meant that we've got a really strong foundation and platform. Um, when COVID hit, you know, we when Boris made his first announcement, I was just like head in hands. Oh my God, you know, um, what does that mean for us? But, and I'd love to say it was all foreplanned with our contingency strategies and everything, but it wasn't, it was pure fluke. Um, we had a cloud-based phone system and all of our ERP type systems were cloud-based and everyone had laptops that worked in the offices. So when Boris made that announcement, I could literally just send everybody home. There was no delay. We had customer services back up and running within half an hour. Um, and the only reason it happened is because our offices are remote. So over the years, we learned <laughs> from lack of Wi-Fi and power cuts and everything else, let's make everyone mobile. Um, so the business boomed during COVID, but what we discovered was that a lot of our customers had lost their revenue streams. You know, there was no Sunday craft fairs or, or markets, uh, church hall events. Um, and if they wanted to send anything out, they had to go and queue in the post office, two metres apart, standing outside in the freezing cold, thinking they might die of COVID, you know, um, on their one hour a day that they were allowed out. Um, and, and we realised that what we were really good at was distribution. We had the couriers coming in uh, five times a day, um, and the couriers could go to our customers as well. So we set up a platform within five weeks that allowed our customers to trade on our platform. We would go and get the goods from them and then we would dispatch them as like a fulfillment house for them as the orders came in. That's what we did. How long did that take to, from ideation to creation and implementation? How long did that take? Five weeks. Oh, wow. You guys act quick. <laughs> Uh, my marketing manager has now banned me from having any ideas because I'm known throughout the company to go, I've had an idea. Oh, I've had an idea. And she's like, no more, just no more. Not allowed anymore. I have to put them in a jar now until they've allowed time to catch up. It's very harsh. <laughs> they can't limit you. <laughs> Uh, but no, that sounds amazing. So the success of that. So what ended up happening is it's still running. Can yep. people get go on still, online and shop? Yep, it's still running. Um, and actually, ten percent of all the profits go back to support small businesses in any way that we can. Um, and that's on uh, tinymarketplace.co.uk, or you could access the marketplace through our Tiny Box Company website as well. Um, so we did that, and then by pure fluke we discovered that everything that we've done with packaging, trying to make it more sustainable, trying to give consumers the option of, of what they're buying. So we say how much is the recycled material, uh, whether it's made in the UK or not, we make it transparent. And we realized that there was nothing out there that was doing the same in the sports market, sportswear market, where fashion is the second highest pollutant in the world. And one in six people around the world works in fashion. It is horrific. So we've pivoted Tiny Box to apply the same rules and we launched Air Active in April, which does exactly the same thing where people can choose where the product's made, what it's made from, and what ethics and sustainability means to them. 
That's amazing. So that launches in April. Um, and in our in our discussion that we had before um, actually recording this, I really liked how you kind of compared. I asked kind of, you know, what's it like selling a completely different product, completely different market? And you described it in a really interesting way, which I never thought of looking at it this way. So do you mind sharing um, how you kind of describe the process of changing products? Um, people around me just think I'm a bit of a fruit loop. Um, yeah, especially working with people now from a fashion background where their whole life has been fashion and it's all about, um, I don't know, the fashion industry just seems to me incredibly old fashioned and very frilly. Uh, but to me, it's just a commodity, it's a product. You know, we need to pile it on the shelves and get it out to the consumers in the best way possible with the lowest damage to the planet. Um, so it doesn't matter whether I'm selling widgets or boxes or a sports bra. Um, it's, it's the same principles. So we'll sit in meetings and they'll be talking about the seams and the buffles or whatever. And I'm just like, <laughs> well, I don't care about that. It's a, it's a top. You know? <laughs> it's like a box, but it's a top. So can we just buy them in that are really nicely made, that are sustainable and not hurting anybody and ship them out? <laughs> Um, so I think people find it a bit weird working with me. No, but I think a lot of people also get caught up in the idea that it has to be um, the perfect product or the perfect pivot. And when you kind of just rule it all down to its simplest form, it's just another, you know, like it's you said, commodity. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So a widget to wear. <laughs> yeah, not to overthink it when you're kind of go looking into expanding or trying out a new business route or whatever that might be for, for who's ever listening. So, yeah. But I had an interesting conversation with uh, Theo Pafitas' team a couple of weeks ago because we'd sort of put a business plan together and it was my fault entirely. I just hadn't got around to explaining to him what we were doing uh, with his money because, you know, you know, he's still got shares in the company. Um, and of course, he owns a clothing brand. So I had to have that very awkward conversation of saying, by the way, you know your clothing brand that isn't as sustainable and ethical as it could be, uh, well, you've just invested one. Anyway, have a nice day. Bye. <laughs> so, uh, so does he, so is, is Air Active owned by the Tiny Box Company? And is it? Okay, got it. Okay. Great. Yeah. Very and, exciting. And Peter Jones recently uh, was on Dragon's Den um, rejecting a lady who I thought had a really good model of effectively renting children's clothing mm. because children grow out of their clothes so quickly. So you rent them, you pay 15 quid a month su subscription and they send you new clothes, you know, perfect. Um, but he said you will never shake up the, the fashion industry, you know, it's too deep rooted. Uh, so I had to have a conversation similar to him saying, well, you know that business you turned down? Well, you've just invested in one similar. But... <laughs> you tell him. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, no, this is, it's been amazing having you on. So I have one um, final question for you. So if you could restart your business tomorrow, what is the one thing that you would change? And what is the one thing that you'd keep the same from your journey? I would change everything <laughs> and probably keep nothing. Good. <laughs> I called it Tiny Box Company because the jewellery company was called Tiny Difference based on the idea you can't change the world, but you can make a tiny difference. Um, so it seemed logical to call it Tiny Box. The problem is that everybody thinks we only sell boxes, which we don't. We sell a whole range of packaging and that all the boxes that we sell are tiny and that we must be a tiny company. Um, and and customers are clearly visibly shocked when we say, well, you know, there's a hundred of us and um, we're in four giant warehouses, you know. Um, so we caused a lot of limitation um, by the branding. But at the same time, we wanted to go down the kind of innocent route where the company had personality. And by calling it Tiny Box, we had personality. Um, but yes, we should have looked at how that limited us. Um, and, and aside from that, the biggest mistake I've made time and time again is lack of confidence. You know, that good old imposter syndrome coming in. And as a result, I haven't been prepared to take risks. And if I'd taken risks, we would probably be in a very different position. 
Uh, I mean, for example, we are 14 years old now. We have no debt. We've got no bank loans. We've got no bank overdraft, nothing. Um, but if I'd raised more funding or gone for loans, debentures or whatever, we could have probably grown a lot faster. Uh, but I, I always wanted to keep my staff safe, keep the foundation safe, be safe for our customers and grow steadily. And I mean, I say steadily, we've grown 46% year on year, every year, pretty much. Um, Which is a but, massive achievement in its own, so. <laughs> um, but I think we could have done a lot faster. Um, so yeah, I would have done, I would, ha I would have had a lot more confidence, a lot more self-belief um, and listened to experts less. Interesting, yeah, very interesting. <laughs> Um, so if people wanted to find the Tiny Box Company, what's the best way to reach out to the Tiny Box Company um, or even maybe reach out to you? Uh, so my Instagram is at Rachel Watkin. Um, Tiny Box Company is tinyboxcompany.co.uk or .com. We've got both domains. Uh, you have to put the company bit in. Tinybox.com was a porn site. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's, it's not anymore and we've bought the domain we just haven't got it up and running yet so yeah tinyboxcompany.com and uh, the clothing range is called Air Active spelt A-I-R-E so it's airactive.co.uk and that launches in about two weeks time and I'm really scared <laughs> No, I'm very excited for it. It's It sounds amazing and it's something that the industry needs. You're right. Um, so well, We've got over £50,000 worth of stock. So please, can people buy some? <laughs> <laughs> On launch day, you'll go, you'll go crazy. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, I'm sure it will. Thank you so much for joining us on the Simply Scale uh, series. We've really appreciated having you. And um, yeah, I think your story is going to help a lot of people. And maybe loads of people will go down Dragon's Den and get some more investment. So quite exciting. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's been lovely. Um, and yes, if you feel that you want to go through Dragon's Den, by all means do, but be prepared. They are brutal. But yeah, if if you can handle the brutality, it's it's a great way of getting your brand out there. Amazing. So go prepared. Go in yeah. prepared. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. And yeah, we'll be sure to be checking on for your uh, Air Active launch on April the 1st, is it? Oh, but do you know what? That's like April Fool's Day. People will think it's not real. Oh, no. Okay. We April, won't. <laughs> April the 2nd. April the 2nd. <laughs> um, but I think what we might do on April Fool's Day is rebrand as the massive box company. I love that. I love it. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs>